Okay, can, I, can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, so, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Anton, Anton McConville. I'm a developer advocate with IBM Bluemix, um, which means I spend most of my time developing applications that showcase our product or working with clients to help onboard them onto it. Um, underneath the covers, I'm a, a sort of experienced developer. I've got apps in the iTunes store. Um, I've had a career that's spanned UX and development, and I lead a tech um, team at, at IBM. So, um, so it's, we're going to get busy with some code during this, this talk. Um, and so the talk is going to be in sort of four little parts. Um, we've got half an hour, and we could spend, we could spend a good two hours working on Swift um, and learning it properly. So we're just going to be skimming the surface. But I'm just going to talk about why Swift makes sense uh, with Cloud Foundry and on the cloud. Um, show a bit the basic structure of working with a Swift project. Um, we're going to do some seat of the pants coding in for 10 or, 10 or 15 minutes, just um, working through a simple example and hopefully deploying that to Bluemix. Uh, and then we're going to look at some future steps so just to, to sort of set the scene a little bit, um, Swift um, is a pretty young language. A quick show of hands, who's coded with Swift in the crowd? Just a few of you. Um, and how many of you are mobile developers um, in general? OK. So it was born in 2010. Um, it really just became public in June 2014, so it's super young, um, and it's it's evolving really rapidly. It's pretty immature. Um, the first sort of public release of the language came in September 2014. And then the second release came in uh, 2015, September 2015, and they're working at the moment on release three. And then the big announcement at the end of last year was OpenSwift. Um, where we had a version of Swift that runs on Linux, and that's the big enabler for getting it on the cloud, so it, it can run on things like Cloud Foundry. So caveat there, it's, it's dead immature. It's, um, you know, 20, 20, December 2015 when it, it started to go open. Um, but the other sort of the flip side of that is now's the time to start paying attention to it because there's so much momentum behind it. Um, IBM, are, they have a, a team of open source developers contributing to it. Apple have a big team. So let's look at sort of, you know, step back a little bit and look at why Swift makes sense. Um, hopefully many of you are familiar with this model. This is like day one computer science. Um, computers only do three things, right? Input, process, and output. And that, the lines used to be pretty clear where those things happened. 2016, they still only do those three things, input, process, and output. But what's really dramatically changed is the number of ways that you can input information. So multimedia, social media, wearable devices, Internet of Things from factories, that sort of stuff, um, location awareness. And the number of targets that we can output has really radically changed as well. So more, we're at the sort of tipping point where more applications are being appreciated on mobile devices than they are on the desktop. But we're also targeting things like haptic, um, you know, communication, touch, um, navigation, awareness, and some of the same things that are input, so wearable devices, um, speech, that sort of stuff. And the only way to make sense of this whole sort of environment is to process it in the cloud because of the volume of data that's available and the variety of sources and targets for that data to connect it all. You know, obviously we need a cloud, and I'm preaching to the choir here because you're at a cloud conference. We also can process the information differently as well. IBM has this thing called Watson. Lots of the other cloud companies have got artificially intelligent um, software. So we no longer need to think of, so of data as just numbers. We can look at it through, um, through natural language as well. So that's the sort of environment we're working in. And Swift really plays well in this environment because it's been designed <clears throat> to run on mobile devices, to interact with social media, to interact with haptics, to interact with um, multimedia, 
and all of the things in the picture, it's, it's kind of a really convenient language for doing a lot of this work. Um, there's no easier way of capturing your voice data than on a, a mobile device, right? Because you've, you've got a, a microphone right there. It's much harder to do that in, through the web. So this is from Apple's website, um, where they say Swift is a modern programming language that is safe, fast, and interactive. And it's their baby, so they're very unlikely to say it's unsafe, slow, and a bugger to work with. But um, it is, I mean, certainly compared with Objective-C, it's, uh, it's much more fun to work with. The syntax is more familiar to things like um, Python or, um, or Go or even JavaScript it takes much more influence from that, but it's built on the solid foundations of Objective-C as well from the, the rich history that it has and it can offer. Um, if you want to play around and experience Swift while I'm talking, you can go to this website and there's an interactive sandbox um, where you can actually program and run it if you want to get your, your fingers uh, dirty with it. So what are the other advantages to Swift? Well, the clear obvious advantage is it works full, full stack. So many of us probably come from the enterprise where we're used to using um, Java or .NET on the server side. And then we have you know, JavaScript, um, HTML on the client side. You know, the days of writing Java on the client side are, I think, you know, falling behind us, at least. Um, and then working with mobile technology as well. So you get a mismatch of languages. And teams are, were, certainly in my experience from the enterprise, teams have been split up into front end and server teams. But then you get people like me. I've had experience in both sides. Um, and the context switch when you're working on a mobile app and then switching back to a different language on the server, it's, it's taxing and time consuming. And there's formatting issues to go through. It's, it's just not as convenient. One of the most beautiful things for me about Cloud Foundry was working with Node and being able to choose where to, to run the JavaScript code, whether that be on the server or the client, and actually moving it back and forwards and experimenting. And not having that contact switch and being able to deliver um, JSON objects really simply and easily from the server to the client. And it's almost seamless. You, know, you're, it, you start to lose the boundaries a bit more. So the, the idea of using Swift full stack, coding on the server, coding on a Raspberry Pi, whatever, and then building your front end piece with, um, with Swift as well, it's, it's really attractive. It sort of opens up the, the opportunities a bit more. It's compiled. So again, with things like Node, which isn't compiled, you just load it up to the server and let it loose. Um, so it's more prone to failing where you don't have that type check and that stronger type check and that compile time. So compiling gives you that advantage as well of, of a, more of a safety check ahead of time. And getting back to those, those sort of Java developers on the server side, what I've noticed from them is that they're slower to adopt JavaScript and Node because it isn't type checked. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's less of a, a, way, of a familiar way of working for them and future friendly. So again, looking at that picture that I showed a few minutes ago, thinking of the future, you know, you've got wearable devices from Apple, you've got their, their laptops, their phones, God knows their car, um, they're all gonna be running with, with Swift. So, you know, people have already written great libraries, even in that short time frame, from the last couple of years for working with Swift on the phone. It's, it's booming sort of area. It's a growing, it's a rapidly growing language, so it's kind of future friendly. It's very modern. So that's sort of the background on why Swift makes sense in the cloud. So working with Swift, what does it take to work with it? So if you want to get started, the place to go is swift.org. Um, so you can just take a, a quick look at that. It's got, uh, it's got details about Swift, you can download the latest releases. If you're a Linux developer, you can get a Linux version of it. Um, you can get the version of Xcode, the latest version of Xcode to work with it on your Mac uh, from the command line as well. It's got getting started um, 
well, getting started walkthrough, which is really good. This is how I learned. I'm not part of any Swift development team. I'm a, I'm a consumer, so learning, hopefully, like most of you. And then what I wanted to do today was be kind of authentic about it and show you the reality of where it's at. Um, so this is the, your starting point. Swift.org is where you go to get set up. And just mentioning that compatibility. So it's compatible on Linux, um, compatible on OS X, obviously. So, you know, the fun thing is it's going to be running on Raspberry Pi soon enough. It's early days still on Linux. So a lot of the foundational libraries that come with Swift on OS X are currently being ported to Linux. So that's a very bare minimum at the moment. Um, but like I'm saying, now's the time to start paying attention. Now's the time to really, if you're interested at all in Swift and the future of programming with it, now's the time to really get engaged with it because I promise you by the end of the year you're going to see a lot more vibrancy on, even on the Linux platform. It's moving so quickly. So one of the things I introduced with OpenSwift was the package manager. And like many other programming languages, um, like Node, for instance, you know, it's your way of organizing things into modules. It's your way of relating dependencies uh, to the code. So this is what makes it possible to take a Swift program and deploy it to the cloud. You've got an organized way of packaging it. So just getting into that, a package consists of a Swift um, source file and the manifest file. Um, the main manifest file is called package.swift. We also use manifest.yaml when we're deploying to Cloud Foundry. Hopefully, we'll see that in a second. Um, and then it has one or more targets uh, where you specify the product. So this is what the package file looks like. Um, so it's a Swift file itself. You're importing the package description. Um, and then you just give it a name and list the dependencies on there. And you can give it a, a, a GitHub or a Git dependency, and it'll, it'll take care of downloading that for you as part of the, the installation. The structure of it looks a little like this. So you have a project folder. Inside there, you have another folder called sources, where you keep your Swift files and your package.swift files. So it's not, it's not rocket science there for the structure of it. And then for building, Swift build. So you go into your, your folder and type Swift build, and it will create um, a dot build folder within which there's a debug folder and um, these artifacts. And to run it, um, you, you type dot build slash debug server. So we're going to um, just quickly make a really quick Hello World program. Um, you guys let me know if you can see this, um, this shell. Can you read it? No? OK. Let me see what I can do. Let me know when you can read it. Because I won't be able to read it. OK. <laughs> OK, so um, I'm just going to make a quick folder called Summit and CD into it. Um, I'm just going to touch a package file just to create it. It's going to be an empty one for a second. And make a sources folder. I'm going to CD into the sources folder. Um, and then I'm not going to use a, an editor just to prove to you it's not any sort of magic that's happening with Xcode. I'm just doing it from the command line, um, which is probably dumb because I'm not going to get any syntax checking or anything. But we're going to keep it simple. So all we're going to do here is just do a hello world. Maybe.
Okay, so we should be able to go back up again. This is just reflecting what I just showed you there, the packaging, and we can do swift build. And we've linked it, so now we can type build, debug, um, what do we call this folder, summit? And you see hello world. So that's your, <laughs> your, your, your basic Swift program. So we're gonna, we're gonna try and do something a little bit more complicated in a second. Um, and then deploy that. So just getting back to the, the slides for just a second. So Copa America, any soccer fans in the crowd? Anyone looking forward to this? One person, so there, there are two of us in here. Copa America is a big soccer tournament from South America. It's 100 years old, and for the first time ever, it's being played in uh, the United States um, this year, and I think next week. Um, I'm a big soccer fan, you can hear from my accent. Although I live in Canada, I'm not originally from North America. Um, and I was really just fascinated by where all of the, uh, the players came from. I was interested in plotting them on a map. So I've been building up this set of data and I thought it might be a fun set of data to work with to show you um, a, quick, a quick app. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna plot the Argentina team on, um, on a map view on, uh, on, a, on the iPhone. And we're gonna serve that from Swift on Bluemix, all being well. Um, I was just to cheat a little bit, so this is what we're gonna build, hopefully. Just to cheat a little bit, I'm gonna take um, a pre-made Hello World app um, that runs on Bluemix already, so this is your starting point. I keep reinforcing that it's very, very early days with Swift. Um, so serving Swift from, uh, from Bluemix, from Cloud Foundry on Bluemix, requires just a socket connection at the moment. That's, that's what this Hello World app is, is built using. So I'm just gonna to go to GitHub. Um, all of this stuff is available on GitHub, by the way, and I'll put all of my workshop on GitHub, and if you follow me on Twitter, I'll tweet out, or just look me up on Twitter, I'll tweet out where um, the coordinates of it are. Um, so again, we'll just create a folder, or we'll just clone it. So we'll start off with the Hello World um, app. And in here, it's gonna look pretty familiar to what I've been talking about already. We've got a package file, we've got um, a manifest, we've got our sources folder in there. Um, let's take a look in the sources folder at the, the man program. And so this has bit, got a bit more Swift going on in it, so you can see it's importing this uh, bit at the beginning is either figuring out if it's on Darwin, on OS X, or if it's on Linux. So it's uh, grabbing different versions of the foundation, depending on what, what's there. It's creating just a, a socket on there, and then it's looking at the um, environment variables, variables in my system. So please don't be taking any photographs when I, when I start running it. Um, but you can see this is building up some HTML to show that. It's getting the environment variables, this line here. Um, so line, um, line 46 there, it's getting the environment variables and then building up a little HTML to show it. And we've got a little socket server down here at the bottom, which thankfully I'm not writing from scratch today. Um, so we'll just go back up and uh, we'll build up. So Swift build again. And you can see in here, it's already shown deprecations. This is one of the things that you'll notice if you're working with Swift, how quickly it changes. Things deprecate like lightning. Um, and it's a nuisance if you're programming an iPhone app at times, but it's also healthy in that they're evolving the language pretty well. But it's one of those things, you've got you to be ready for working with it, because it's so changeable. So if we run this, you can see it's starting, um, it says server's listening on port 9080. So um, a little hard to see, can I? 
So you can see here, it's just going through the environment variables in my system and printing them out on screen. Um, so we've built a little Swift app, and this will deploy to, to Bluemix or to um, whatever Cloud Foundry um, host that you're, you're using, as long as it supports the Swift build pack. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to take a JSON file. Um, so I've got one called Copa, I think. Copa JSON, um, and put it right there. And then we're going to edit the, um, the main file. And it's not going to be a crazy program. All we're going to do is serve this um, JSON data from the Swift um, backend. So I'm just going to get rid of the, this bit where it puts together the environment variables. So let's see, maybe. OK. And this time around, rather than um, do that, we're going to just read from the file system. So I'm just taking, just getting the path to the file system there, to that file, and then reading that into an NS data ob object. So that's a, that's a, a native um, object for, uh, for iOS usually. Um, and then for the response body, what I'm going to do is just encode that. That data. So, you know, in the real world, you'd be getting your data from some other source. A lot of this data, I actually mined script from Wikipedia. So, ideally, you'd, you'd use um, Swift for doing that kind of thing. There are some good um, libraries already for doing things like screen scraping with Swift. So it's kind of risky for me doing this here, just right in the raw um, file. But I, I wanted to give you that sort of simplistic authenticity of doing it in a, just in a VI session. So that should be enough to get us our string and encode it. Um, the other thing we're going to do here is the content type is now just going to be application and JSON. And so, fingers crossed. Um, that should build. Oh, okay. So I've got an error it's saying it should be var instead of let for response body. <laughs> Do I have? I must have two of them. Yeah, there we go. Phew, it built. Okay, so um, now if I try and run that. So when I refresh the page this time, we've got our JSON data showing up there. These are the um, Argentina footballers that we want to see. We've got latitude and longitude in there. So that's pretty cool. What would be even cooler if we got that onto the cloud? So what I'm going to do is for the sake of speed is take one that I, I take a manifest file that I built earlier. Um, and it's, we've called it Swift CF Summit here. Um, so if I just quickly go to Bluemix, 
Now, I did deploy this earlier and then deleted it, so we've got the spinning, the spinning wheel of death here on Bluemix, but um, it should be fine. It's just, I think I closed my laptop while I was still doing it. So there we go. Um, it's not there. Um, so if I do a CF push, um, I've already logged in and everything, so it should find my endpoint. It's using the manifest file there. Um, one of the things in the manifest file is this, that it's got a Swift build pack on there, so you can see it's starting to upload. We'll leave it to upload, and I'll get back just to... Um, actually, what I'm, what I'm going to do is pretend that it's going to upload and go into, the, uh, into Xcode and show you this little app. Um, see if I can find this. I keep moving these things around. Can you read this okay? Yeah. Okay, good stuff. Um, this isn't a very sophisticated um, program at all. It's just uh, one view, a map view. And so we've got view controller Swift here. And we've got the beach ball of death. Okay, there it recovered. Um, so in this view, what I'm doing is I'm setting an initial location, which is around Argentina, centering the map on that location. And then I'm taking that um, data source. So I've actually programmed it already. So it's just taking um, swiftcfsummit.mybluemix.net, so that's that JSON data that we just put together and then parsing through, finding an uh, Argentina item, um, getting the latitude and longitude, and just plot, plotting it on the map. So if we have deployed, it's just still starting the app there. Um, I'm just going to let it do that and multitask back in here. And we'll look at that in a second. So I'm just a little bit worried about running out of time. So future steps. Kaitura is um, a web framework um, that's being developed by the IBM team. Um, so if you're familiar with Node, it's like Express, except for Swift. And that's coming along. Um, keep your ear to the ground. There's going to be some big announcements on that and during the summer, probably around the developer conference time frame for, for Apple. Um, so that's, I'm looking forward to that coming so that I don't have to use sockets anymore. I can build proper web apps. Swift 3 is coming along. There's some new, uh, new evolution steps in there. Um, Windows is a curious one. So there's talk of Swift appearing on all kinds of platforms. This was a link that I saw um, the other day when I was putting the slides together. So Microsoft also working on a Swift compiler I've read. Um, Google are considering it for Android. There's <laughs> another rumor. I don't know if these are malicious rumors coming from Apple or what. Um, but I keep hearing these things. Um, Bluemix and Swift, um, from this web address, you can see how they relate to each other. Um, I've shown you um, IBM's really deeply entrenched in Swift and, and believing in it for its future. Um, there's a whole bunch of open Swift packages as well linked in there, and then this workshop is there as well. Um, that's that's all of the slides. I just want to see if we can get this app running and show you that. So we have apparently, we're apparently running. Um, so if you go back to Bluemix, and I refresh here. Um, so you can see, oh, I've got two of them somehow. Um, oh, one of them's gone. <laughs> It's good. So if we view the app, we can see it's running in the cloud now. That, that same code that I just that I just programmed. Um, if we start up the simulator, hopefully it's starting. We should see. There we go. So it's consumed the data and it's plotting the pins on the map. So 100% Swift server and client. And that's all I've got for you. I can take questions. Thanks very much for listening.
<laughs> Argentina. <laughs> Yourself? <laughs> Any other? Any other questions? Yeah, that, the package manager that I was showing you is, is, works very similarly. If you go to swift.org, you can read about it more in detail there. I had to skim through it, but definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't quite hear you. For, for Swift, um, there are a bunch of them. Um, they're, being, they're being pretty diligent with this one um, in trying to get it using, and trying to port as much of the native foundation stuff as possible. A lot of the other frameworks have cheated to polyfill while, um, while the Linux equivalent is being made. So I would, I would put my money on this one. I'm being patient and waiting to use the Kaitura one. Yeah, so, I mean, I'd be lying if I told you that I'm a language expert. I'm like a, a shameless consumer of these things. I, I'm a front-end developer and a designer, and that's, but from what I've seen, um, I would prefer using Swift to Java, for sure. It's not as verbose. It's not, um, you don't necessarily need as many files, you know, headers and footers and things like that. There's, it's a single file, it's lightweight. Um, it's very script-like. Um, so it's strong that way. It's 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 a good language that way. It's type. It's strongly typed as well. So better if you like strongly typed languages, better obviously than Node. But it gives you the familiarity of using like a scripting kind of tone on the server. Um, so they're they're the language sort of strengths as I see them. And then the value of it is is you've got that huge ecosystem that Apple are building and all those amazing libraries and APIs that go along with it from whatever service you want. You can start to consume those easily. You've got ready-made APIs on there for, for, for using them. Yeah? This is a question that you're probably not going to know the answer to, but the immediate thing that comes to my mind to compare it to is Go. Yeah, which I've has heard that. that yeah. definition of uh, version one not going to break it until version yes. 2. Yes. So I was just wondering if you have any idea of when they're going to finally like say, yes, it's done and we're, we're not going to break the syntax. Now. I would love an answer to that question too. Um, but I'm, I'm tolerant enough. I mean, it was, it was sort of awkward at times programming on the client side for that. Um, but the benefits far outstrip the drawbacks, certainly compared to programming with Objective-C in the past. So. It's one of those worlds, right? It's, it's one of those things. But I've heard a lot of people compare it to Go. Anything else? We had a son that was uh, wanted to become a programmer. Uh, is there, is, and he wants to become a Swift programmer. Is there any other, like, did you learn JavaScript first, or was he just brand new to programming? Um, if he's brand new, I would say it's probably a good idea just to start with Swift and start learning it. To start. Um, and I would say probably on the client, like start building, if you've got a Mac, start building iPhone apps with it. It's fun and you get an instant gratification. Like you've seen like this little program, there's hardly any lines of code in it and you know, you can run it in your phone. So, and so it's, it's a fun way and then he'll be able to graduate really easily into running stuff in the server. So. Yeah. Um, so for the like for the server side Swift, you you need to use that sort of package management. I haven't kept up with how that works on the on the client side. On the client side, you typically build with Xcode, takes care of all that stuff for you, um, and packaging it up. Um, I imagine they're probably going to align. I would go to Swift.org and, and read about um, the future for it. Okay, thanks thanks again, guys. Have a safe trip home. Thanks.